All right, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, thank you all for coming back. I hope you had an enjoyable lunch. Um, I have an announcement. Uh, I've been asked by many people if the presentations at this conference will be available online. And yes, they will be. They will be in a, Alex, if I'm not mistaken, a podcast. Uh, well, they'll be on YouTube. They'll be on YouTube. I don't know the difference between YouTube and a podcast. <laughs> but it, it will be on YouTube uh, probably in two weeks or so. Uh, that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I need to correct uh, uh, a historical injustice that resulted from uh, some lack of communication because I realized uh, that uh, Gabriella Safran and Kenneth Moss had not been introduced. <laughs> so uh, I shall correct this. Uh, Gabriella Safran <laughs> is uh, the Eva Chernoff uh, Loki professor in Jewish studies at Stanford and teaches in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. <laughs> and, and Kenneth Moss is the Posen Associate Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Johns Hopkins University and is author of The Jewish Renaissance in the Russian Revolution. Uh, Revolution. <laughs> so before we go farther, I want to mention two book events that everyone in this room, uh, simply by virtue of being in this room, you should know about. The first is the publication of uh, uh, David Fishman's Book Smugglers, uh, which uh, if you are interested in the extraordinary story of the rescue of uh, Jewish materials during the Holocaust, it is not a must read, it's the only read. And uh, I, I suggest that you go to find out more about this to the exhibition uh, that is located, how do, how do I describe this? In the smart, on the third floor, you take the elevator by the entryway up to the third floor. It's a wonderful exhibition of Yivo's materials concerning the smuggling of Jewish artifacts out of Yivo into the ghetto as well as uh, the destruction of Jewish materials by the Nazis during the war. Um, it's a great story. There's, there, there, there is a movie that is underway about this, and I, I know I've had inquiries recently from any number of movie companies wishing to make films of this. Uh, the other is, I was just found out today, Cecile Kuznets's Evo and the Making of Modern Jewish Culture, which uh, has just come out in paperback. So congratulations to everyone. Now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce the second part of today's conference. And um, uh, so I will introduce everybody at once so no one is overlooked. Our first speaker is uh, Elisa Bemparad, who is the Jerry and William Unger Pro Associate Professor of East European Jewish History in the Holocaust at Queens College and the CUNY Graduate Center. She's the author of Becoming Soviet Jews, The Bolshevik Experiment in Minsk. Our second speaker will be Josh Rubinstein, Joshua Rubinstein, who is a longtime associate of Harvard's Davis Center of Russian and Eur Eurasian Studies and is currently Associate Director for Major Gifts at Harvard Law School. He is also the uh, co-author of Stalin's Secret Pogrom. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Joshua Myers, who is a PhD candidate in the history department at Stanford University with a specialization in modern Jewish political history. Thank you all. And I welcome Elisa to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Steve and Jonathan for organizing this um, wonderful conference. 
Um, my talk today is really a first attempt to put together some reflections, some cogent thoughts about um, Esther Frumkin, uh, someone I have been um, interested and I have been fascinated with for, su for quite some time. Um, and I, I believe that one of the first scholars who has discovered, or the first scholar who has discovered Esther Frumkin is Zvi Gittelman. Um, and I, I hope to be able to write a biography um, of Esther Frumkin in the next few years. The gifted reporter and prominent figure in the modern Hebrew and Yiddish press, Benzion Katz, dubbed Esther Frumkin as the Sore Bastovim of the revolution. Sore Bastovim was the 18th century emblematic author of the Trinis, the private devotions usually written in Yiddish primarily for women. Benzion Katz was most likely referring here to the fact that not unlike Sore Bastuvim, Esther Frumkin was an elusive figure of remarkable passion, extreme devotion, stark independence, and perhaps of legendary status. She was, wrote Benzion Katz, the Rebitzin of the revolution. <laughs> the life and work of Esther Frumkin represent an essential chapter in the history of the Jewish and the general revolutionary movement in Russia, as well as of the tragic compromises that its leaders made following the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, as they were forced to, or chose to, ravage what they had helped to build. Born in 1880 in the city of Minsk, in a well-to-do family of wood merchants, her father a maskil, educated in secular subjects, and her mother a descendant from the distinguished Vilna families of the Katzenellenbogens and the Roms, Malka Lifshitz, better known by her revolutionary pseudonym of Esther, Esther Frumkin, became one of the most prominent Jewish female political activists and radical women essayists in late imperial Russia and in the early Soviet Union. With her strong temperament, the tall, black-haired, powerful orator came at times to dominate the political platforms and influence policymaking in the Bund, the Jewish Socialist Party she joined in 1901. Throughout her life, she voiced extreme positions, in particular in connection with her two unrelenting passions to which she dedicated herself with remarkable perseverance, namely the Yiddish cause and that of the Jewish proletariat. Closely intertwined, these two commitments found their origins in the nature of the city in which she grew up. Minsk turned Esther into a professional revolutionary while nurturing early on her sensitivity for the cause of the downtrodden Yiddish language, the language of the Jewish working masses, for which she bemoaned the unequal status with Hebrew, the language of the religious elites and the holy scriptures, and for the cause of the downtrodden proletariat, in particular, the chronically impoverished Jewish workers who resided in the neighborhood of the so-called Minsker Blotis, or the Minsk Swamps. Under the influence of the early socialist movement led by activist and poet Avram Liesin, Esther led a circle for young women workers, teaching them the basics of political and cultural organization, literacy classes, as she tried to make them aware of what it meant to monitor factory conditions, fight against female unemployment and prostitution. While in St. Petersburg, where she moved after graduating from the Minsk Women's Gymnasium, she impressed the local Jewish intelligentsia. As a student in the Pedagogical Institute, focusing on Russian history and literature, who spent her nights avidly reading Marxist literature, Esther Frumkin was the only one among Jewish university students in the late 1890s who, in the Russian capital showed an interest in Yiddish. The librarian of the St. Petersburg, Hevra Mefice Haskala Library, was startled 
when Esther approached him, asking him for reading material in Yiddish. It was odd, he recalled, for a member of the student circles to request Yiddish books. In fact, it was such a wonder that the librarian told everyone, even Baron Ginsburg, about the student Lifshitz who in the capital city sought books in Yiddish. It is not that surprising if in the Bund, Esther became a proponent of the so-called nationalist school supporting the use of Yiddish in all fields of Jewish life as the repository of Jewish national consciousness. She expressed her support for radical Yiddishism, secularist and Marxist, after the 1905 Russian Revolution. And this support reached its peak in 1908 during the Chernovitz Conference when Esther spoke in favor of proletarian Yiddishism, opposing Yudlamed Peretz's proposal to create a worldwide Jewish cultural organization and proposing a resolution that Yiddish be recognized as the only Jewish national language. Under the Soviets, Esther Frumkin was instrumental in establishing Yiddish schools and in the official recognition of Yiddish as one of the national languages of the Soviet Union. Before 1917, Esther played a key role in disseminating propaganda among Jews, both in oral and written form. She engaged in underground work, spreading calls to action, traveling through the cities and towns of Lita, speaking at secret Bundes gatherings in the forest, and just a few hours later in a Weiber Shishul in the women's section of the synagogue. A talented editor and essayist who wrote extensively under many pseudonyms, Esther became a longtime contributor to the first Bundes publication, Der Wecker, first from Vilna and then from Minsk. In simple, clear, and at times lyric style, her articles often drew from traditional Jewish texts. On August 1st, 1917, for example, she published in Der Wecker an editorial explaining why we do not need the Tsar, in which she drew from the prophet Samuel's warning to the Israelites not to appoint a king. A year later, on October 11, 1918, in a fierce attack against the leaders of the Minsk Jewish community, who she blamed for working together with the conservative Belarusian Rada, or council, Esther warned them and quoted the first line of the first chapter of the Psalms, happy is the man who does not join the company of the insolent. After October 1917, Esther joined the general chorus of Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries condemning the Bolsheviks as traitors of the revolution. But at this stage of the revolution, the relationship between Lenin and the Bund, in particular, became a two-way courtship from which Esther was not left out. The apparent lack of support in the provinces especially drove the Bolsheviks to rely heavily on the Bund in order to build communism, thus compromising on the historic strain between the Bolshevik leader and the Jewish party, which dated back to 1903. In Minsk, for example, the Revolutionary Committee resolved to close down all non-communist publications with the exception of the Bund's central organ, edited by Esther, the Wecker became therefore the only newspaper in Minsk that never ceased publication during the years of turmoil from 1917 to 1921. In Bolshevik Minsk, Esther was also entrusted with important public offices and was appointed Deputy People's Commissariat for Education of the newly established Soviet Socialist Re Belarusian Republic, as well as a member of the City Municipal Council. But if the Bolsheviks needed the Bundists, the Bundists needed the Bolsheviks. The extreme violence of the pogroms in Ukraine and Belarus mobilized Jews into supporting the Red Army and prompted many young Bundists to join the Bolshevik forces. Esther, too, became closer to the Soviet camp. When in 1919, on the eve of Pilsudski's army's invasion of Belarus, 
The Red Army organized armed groups to defend the city. Esther not only helped create the combat units, but she also actively participated in the military training sessions, during which she always occupied the front row because of her height. The choice of siding with the Bolsheviks, however, was not only a question of protection from and revenge for the anti-Jewish violence unleashed during the Civil War. Siding with the Bolsheviks also entailed empowerment. It was triggered, I would argue, by the appeal of power and authority. In fact, one can only imagine how a 20-year experience of underground activities not devoid of disruption, dislocation, sacrifice, hiding, separation from family and friends, she was imprisoned at least three times and in 1912 was banished to Siberia. How all of this turned the prospect of legality, status, authority into something immensely desirable, even despite the compromise. If in 1907 Esther had to face the unsettling experience of, the, of her five-year-old daughter, Freydlin, visiting her in prison together with her mother, at the end of the 1920s, she could take pride in her daughter's graduation from the prestigious Moscow Institute of Red Professors, alongside many prominent party and Soviet officials and leaders in the Soviet sciences and culture. Serving in prominent positions in the Communist Party, in the Soviet administration, and in the cultural life of the capital, of the new capital, Moscow, where she settled in 1921, Esther became a beneficiary of the Bolshevik state. She was the only woman in the upper ranks of the Yevsekzia leadership, the Jewish sec section of the Communist Party, in which she became a forceful and influential voice molding events in Soviet Jewish life for years. She became, and I will come back to the other images in a minute, she became one of the chief editors of the central Soviet Yiddish newspaper, Der Emes. She co-edited eight volumes of Lenin's selected works in Yiddish and wrote a biography of the Bolshevik leader in Yiddish, which was widely read in the Soviet Jewish schools throughout the empire. Here you see um, Esther uh, at the far right of this uh, uh, photo, and here you see her in the first row. This is um, from 1926. This is the, um, in Moscow, the first conference of the Gezerd, uh, the Society for the Resettlement of, Jews, of Jewish Toilers on Land. Um, I will leave it here, and then I'll come back to the other um, slides. In 1921, Esther was appointed vice rector of the Communist University of National Minorities of the West. And in 1925, following the death of the well-known Polish communist activist Julian Marchlewski, she was elected rector in his lieu. The university trained future party cadres who were instructed in their national languages. Esther, who felt personally responsible for the approximately 1,000 students enrolled at the university, and who, according to one of the language instructors there, knew each one of them by name, showed a keen aptness not only for academic issues, she taught an advanced seminar on Leninism, if you, you know, if you think that is academic, but you know, that's a different question, but she also had an aptness for political uh, issues. This position, which was held until 1936, required someone who was deeply knowledgeable in issues pertaining to the Communist parties in different countries, as well as someone with close connections with the Central Committee of the Communist Party. It is impossible to imagine a Jewish woman playing such a leading role in public life in pre-revolutionary Moscow. I would like to turn now to a different aspect of Esther Frumkin's life and choices, which shed light on the role that women came to play in and after the Bolshevik Revolution, and captures the complexity of her elusive personality. 
I'm referring here to Esther's passionate engagement in the campaign to destroy Judaism. Namely, I am talking about a woman who became a prime mover and the vanguard in the systematic propaganda targeting Jewish religious institutions, and in particular, religious leadership. Esther, by the way, was among the very first activists to set foot in the great choral synagogue in Minsk to seize its building and to turn it into a workers' club. Esther trailblazed the anti-religious campaign at a time when, this is in, you know, early on, at a time when Soviet authorities were somewhat hesitant to launch their onslaught on Judaism. They eventually would have, of course, but in the beginning they're somewhat hesitant aware of the extraordinary degree of destruction suffered by Jews during the Civil War of 1918-1921, during which synagogues had been extensively looted and destroyed, Soviet authorities thought that the attack on Jewish religious institutions and leaders would be interpreted by Jews as a new wave of pogroms. But Esther had other priorities. In 1922, she wrote one of the most powerful pamphlets attacking Judaism to appear in the context of the Soviet state's assault on religion. Published in Russian in 1923, Daloy Ravinov, Down with the Rabbis, appeared in two editions. And actually, for those of you who know Russian, Unas Atvietov Nogatov, Daloy Ravinov i Papov, right? Um, it was published in 1922, 1923, and this is the second um, edition, which is, you know, more graphic, more exciting, um, I guess. Um, um, so what stands out in this text is the rage, the resentment, and the extreme violence of the rhetoric which I must admit, the first time I read it, I was startled. And I have read, you know, texts that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, contain violence, um, uh, violent rhetoric. But I was startled only at first. While largely understudied, Jewish women's active participation in what Laura Engelstein calls civil society revolution or horizontal revolution referring to the anti-authoritarian anger that most people in and after 1917 channeled against any vestige of the ancien regime and ruling class should not be that surprising. In the new socialist state, which was to be by definition anti-authoritarian, women were not immune to that rage. Zlata Litvakova, for example, sister of Moshe Litvakov, one of the major players in the communist Jewish camp, was an eager participant in the confiscation of Hebrew books preserved in the Jewish libraries across the cities and towns of Ukraine. On one occasion, Zlata discovered that a Jewish library in Kharkov was secretly hiding Hebrew books. She flew into a rage and ordered to burn the books at once. And indeed, those books were burnt. In this text, Daloy Ravinov, Esther described and celebrated the war of terror that took place on the Jewish street in the cities of Ukraine and Belarusia between religious leaders and young Jewish communists and workers. She recorded the, class, the clashes between the activists who stormed the synagogues on the day of Yom Kippur in 1922 and the believers who attacked them as the Soviet armed forces intervened to protect the Jewish commissars. She wrote, quote, we must liquidate the cheder with a death sentence and destroy the clerical vermin. And she reveled in describing how the chanting of the international welcomed the death of the cheder and at the same time silenced the voice of those who protested by attempting to sing the Hatikva. Finally, as she chronicled the arrest of Rabbi Borshansky of Gomel and Rabbi Kapilievich of Minsk, Esther Frumki mocked the petitions that Jews from abroad addressed in protest to the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to Lenin himself. She stated clearly that the rabbis should, 
quote, be sentenced, they should be pu punished in the concentration camp, in the concentrazioni lager. So why did Esther write this and why such rage? First, promoting the destruction of bourgeois Jewish religious life could redeem her from a pre-revolutionary Bundist past as Tzvi Gittelman has shown. But what I recently discovered is that while living in exile in Astrakhan, in the city of Chorniyar, and working as a teacher in a school for children of war refugees, Esther Frumkin fell in love with a local rabbi, married him, and gave birth to a child. Now the rabbi, of course, was most likely a Kazion Niravin, a crown rabbi. She then had to face the criticism of her comrades and even confront the rumors about her alleged pro-Zionist leanings as a result of the marriage. Whether this change of heart because of her husband, whom she shortly thereafter divorced, was true or not, her inquisitorial zeal to pioneer the war against Judaism and its leaders might have also been a way to wash off the rumored sin. Let me point out one more unique feature of this text that can help us pinpoint why and how Esther wrote this. Compared to the rich anti-religious literature produced in the Soviet Union during the 1920s, which was more often than not published in Yiddish, Down with the Rabbis was not addressed to the Jews, but to a Russian, namely non-Jewish audience. While enlightening the non-Jewish readers about the peculiar practices of the Jewish religion, she even explains in detail the practice of the Kaporis ritual, Esther also reassured them that an unforgiving civil war was indeed taking place on the Jewish street, and that this war was much more uncompromising and incisive than the one happening among the Christian population against the churches and the Orthodox faith. Not devoid of a deep apologetic undertone, Esther's words were meant to counter anti-Semitism and quell the widespread notion that the Soviet state supported and protected the Jews and that the Jewish commissars shielded Judaism. She wanted to confirm the absurdity of the claim of Jewish Bolshevism, which gained credibility in the aftermath of the Civil War. And lastly, Esther might have nurtured some bitterness toward the religious leadership and infrastructure since it ultimately offered greater resistance and showed a greater ability to adapt to the regime than the Bund had. As Esther Frumke poignantly noted in the mid-1920s, quote, no Jewish socialist party fought for its principles with as much vigor and devotion as these Jews wrapped in their prayer shawls. To conclude, since I have, I have very little time, um, um, and this is about Esther's commitment in the early period, in the early years of the revolution to Bundism. In the early years following the revolution, Esther might have attempted earnestly to find a compromise between the ideas of the Bund, national culture, autonomy, and Yiddish for the Jewish proletariat and communism. But Bundism ultimately did not persist in the Soviet Union. Despite Esther's outspoken role in repudiating her own past and allegiances, during the anti-Bundist campaigns of the early 1930s, she was accused of idealizing the Jewish party and of sabotaging the party's struggle against a counter-revolution. She quickly wrote a statement to the party declaring that she withdrew her books from sale because of their counter-revolutionary content. In other words, she was forced to repudiate the work in which she strove to negotiate between renouncing the Bund's essence and defending the ideas of the revolution. When she was arrested in 1938 as an enemy of the people and sentenced to eight years in a forced labor camp in Kazakhstan, where she eventually perished in 1943, she wrote an appeal to Stalin, pleading with the Vojd to reconsider her case. I have not found Esther's plea in the archives yet, nor have I found the document about the arrest and purge of her daughter Freidlin, the same daughter who had visited her in prison back in 1907, when she was considered a criminal by the Tsar. <clears throat> 
The Soviet Union eventually rehabilitated Esther Frumkin in 1956, pardoning her alleged crimes against the regime. But the Bund did not rehabilitate her. And Esther Frumkin was not listed among the hundreds of activists whose biographies were included in the comprehensive work, Generation of Bundists. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Since we're here to think about and speak about the centenary of the Russian Revolution and its relation to Jews, I thought I'd begin with the story about Leon Trotsky that transpired just a few miles from here. Trotsky arrived in New York in the beginning of January of 2017. It was his only sojourn in North America. He was being exiled from Europe in the midst of World War I. He was welcomed by Jewish socialists. He gave interviews to Abe Gahan at the Forward, the Yiddish Forwards, uh, several articles. He wrote several articles, and the interview was published in the Forwards. He and his family, his wife and their two sons, it was his second family, his two daughters and his first wife, remained in, in Russia and took up residence in the Bronx. And Trotsky developed a daily habit of having lunch or dinner at a Jewish vegetarian restaurant. There are many reasons why he might have chosen to eat there. The waiters were all Russian Jews like himself, so they spoke his language. He did not speak English well at all. The food was probably familiar to him. But Trotsky displayed a certain fanaticism in that restaurant that presaged the fanaticism to come. <laughs> he not only refused to leave a tip for the waiters <laughs> as a reflection of his belief that they should be paid what we would call a living wage, but he also harangued the other customers not to leave a tip for the waiters. <laughs> This so endeared him to the waiters <laughs> that they would, were very reluctant to serve him. They would spill soup on him. <laughs> One waiter took Rachmanis on him, took pity on him, and befriended Trotsky. And Trotsky was open about his dreams that he was going to return to Russia to make a revolution. Remember, this is January 1917. And the waiter said to him, look, you've got to give up this Meshuggah dream. You're here in the Golden of Medina. What Jew leaves New York to go back to Russia? Now, everyone's laughing as I tell this story because it seems so cute. But in fact, uh, the germ of this story is actually reflects a great deal of the tragedy of the revolution and of Trotsky's own life. Throughout his life, whether he was in Paris or Vienna or New York or Berlin, he was among Jews, either because they were in the revolutionary movement or because they were familiar to him and they spoke his native language, which was, of course, Russian. At the same time, no matter where he was, he was so far brent, so taken, with his revolutionary fervor that even in that little piece of the Bronx, he had to find a way to apply his revolutionary beliefs on, this, on these hapless waiters. <laughs> Keep in mind that within eight or nine months of his time in the Bronx, he and Lenin took over the Russian Empire. And he applied those same fanatical principles to the largest country on earth. Now, with that in mind, let me say a few uh, broader strokes about Trotsky and, and his attitude toward uh, his Jewish background. Trotsky was born to a Jewish family in southern Ukraine, not in the shtetls, but actually on a, in a Jewish farm, an area that was colonized by Jews in the mid-19th century. His father was a very prosperous farmer, and he was raised among Jews. He was actually sent to a cheder, 
He tells us in his memoirs when he was six or seven, but he was only there for a few months because according to Trotsky, the language of education, of learning, was Yiddish. And he claims he did not know enough Yiddish to get along in the class. So his parents withdrew him from the school. Later as an adolescent, he was obviously very bright, he was sent to a gymnasium in Odessa, which was you know, several hours away from his parents' home. He lived with his mother's nephew. And the, the wife of his mother's nephew was the director of a, a school for Jewish girls, a gymnasium for Jewish young women in Odessa. So he was being raised by people who were very self-identified as Jews. And Odessa was a very, it was a, a city with a great Jewish uh, population. None of this stuck with Trotsky from an emotional point of view. It's clear that he felt very distant from his Jewish origins. He was taken by Russian culture and soon enough by Marxist uh, ideology. But, he, but the idea of having a, an emotional connection to his Jewish background was foreign to Trotsky. Trotsky lacked a Havat Yisrael, a love for the Jewish people, or a commitment to its historical continuity. The Jews were just another small persecuted minority. As a child, he did not identify with his fellow Jews. As an adolescent in Odessa, living in a Jewish household, he absorbed little, if any, emotional attachment to his origin. We know now that his father arranged for him to have studies in Bible. This would have been for his bar mitzvah. But these studies did not continue, and as far as we know, he never had a bar mitzvah. When the allure of Marxism captured his imagination and his faith, Trotsky abandoned his Jewish identity. For him, it was a necessary step toward embracing all of humanity, or at least the proletariat. So he claimed that prejudice against the Jews was not a major factor in his hatred of the autocracy, which was certainly not true of all the other Jewish revolutionaries in Russia at the turn of the century and in the years living up to the revolution. I think it's fair to say that the experience of anti-Semitism uh, under the Tsar, whether their families were living in the Pale of Settlement or living in other parts of the empire, certainly fueled their hatred of the Tsar and of the autocracy. But that was not true for Trotsky, at least according to his own memoirs. So Trotsky could assert he was a Marxist and a Russian revolutionary, then deny his identity as a Jew. But his rejection of his Jewish origin was itself a form of engagement. As he spurred one messianic religion, he adopted an alternative utopian faith, one that was secular and far more dangerous. Trotsky spent a good deal of his adult life among Jews in London, Paris, Vienna, New York, and Russia itself. His strategy, deliberate or unconscious, must have been relentless in order to withstand nostalgic attraction. Sitting in the Kremlin during and after the Civil War, he turned away delegations of Jewish communal and religious leaders who thought he might be open to special appeals. When Rabbi Jacob Mazev of Moscow, Rabbi Mazev was the last uh, chief rabbi of Moscow under the Tsar, today in Tel Aviv there's a street in his honor, Rafov Mazev, that's in honor of Rabbi Jacob Mazev. When Rabbi Mazev came to him for assistance, Trotsky declared, I am not a Jew, I'm a Marxist internationalist. I have nothing in common with Jewish things and want to know nothing about Jewish things. In Trotsky's eyes, the Jewish petitioners were assuming an intimate connection that he refused to affirm. So he turned away appeals from observant Jews. They were an unwelcome reminder of his origin, a piece of his identity he thought he had left behind, as if he could resign from the Jewish people. After their meeting, Rabbi Mazer was reported to observe the Trotskys make the revolutions, and the Bronsteins pay the bills. Of course, that was Trotsky's original name, Lev Davidovich Bronstein. Uh, Gregory Zinoviev, another Bolshevik leader who was of Jewish origin, claimed in 1918 that rabbis in Odessa excommunicated him and Trotsky. Trotsky was neither ashamed of his Jewish origin nor ashamed to deny them. On party forms, he wrote Jew as his nationality, but when he arrived in Mexico in January 1937, he wrote the word nothing in the blank on his Mexican passport where they were asking for his religious 
affiliation. Now, Trotsky, in spite of, uh, there are certain parts of his life where, which reflected this disdain for his Jewish origins and his affirmation toward being a Marxist internationalist. We've already heard mention that Weizmann was in Switzerland where he encountered uh, Russian Jewish students who were there to study because they couldn't make progress in Russian educational system uh, back in the empire. And so Lenin, Plekhanov, and Trotsky were there to propagandize with them to join the revolutionary parties. And Weizmann reported the disdain these Marxists had toward these Jewish students who said, though they were concerned about Jewish faith, and they wanted to work for, to better the Jews, and Trotsky and the others were, showed nothing but disdain that these students should be concerned about Russia's general fate and, of course, the fate of the revolution. And so they were very disdainful of Zionism and of the Bund, of course. Plekhanov was known to dismiss the Bund as Zionists who are afraid of seasickness. <laughs> and Trotsky, I think it's fair to say, shared this uh, condescension. In 1903, at the... Uh, Conference of Social Democrats in London in the very wake of the Kishinev pogrom and a very high number of a high proportion of the delegates were Jewish and so they were very much offended and, and upset about the pogrom. Nonetheless, Lenin and Trotsky had to take on the Bund and the Bund's insistence that they should be the ones to represent the Jewish workers only. And this was of course in contradiction of the Bolsheviks approach to creating a centralized party. And Trotsky took the lead in denouncing the Bund and winning the day for the Bolsheviks. And the Bundist members took very real offense at Trotsky for his attitude. But in spite of this, Trotsky retained a certain uh, allegiance to his Jewish origins in the fact that he never abided physical attacks on Jews. During the 1905 revolution, Trotsky became head of the Petersburg, St. Petersburg Soviet. It was really his first time that he stepped onto the stage of history. And he was later arrested for this and brought to trial in 1906 at a time when pogroms were taking place across the Russian Empire. 800 Jews were killed in Odessa in one day. Over 3,000 Jews were killed in over 700 communities. And when Trotsky took the stand um, and he faced a possible death sentence. When he took the stand, he denounced the regime as a Jew, interestingly enough, because Trotsky never abided physical attacks on Jews and often intervened to denounce such violence and organize a defense. And this is what he said during the trial. We had no doubt that behind the facade of the Black Hundreds, the anti-Semitic hordes, was the powerful fist of the ruling clique, what we possess is not a national government force, but an automaton for mass murder. I can find no other name for the machine of government that cuts into pieces the living flesh of our people, and he meant Jews. And if you tell me that the pogroms, the arson, the violence, if you tell me that all that has happened in Tver, Rostov, Kursk, if you told me that Kishinev, Odessa, Bialystok represent the form of government of the Russian Empire, then yes, then I recognize together with the prosecution, that in October and November, we were arming ourselves against the form of government of the Russian Empire. No non-Jewish revolutionary had ever confronted czarist officials with such defiant words about their violent, anti-Semitic animosity. Now, over the next few years, Trotsky forged a role for himself as an independent Marxist. He was caught in between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, but he made his living as a journalist. So for example, he went to Romania and Bulgaria in 1912 and 1913 during what we call the First and Second Balkan Wars. These were the wars on the eve of World War I. And he visited Jewish communities, very beleaguered, impoverished Jewish communities. And I urge you to read his reporting on his travels. On the one hand, he writes very vividly and full of sympathy for their plight, especially in Romania. And he does not always engage in Marxist rhetoric that the solution is a revolution and a Marxist revolution and dictatorship of the proletariat. He really focuses on their plight and he showed a certain degree of identification for what they were going through. And then when he returned to Russia after the fall of the Tsar from New York, 
In the spring of 1917, he arrived in May, and he and Lenin engineered the coup d'etat. That fall, Lenin proposes that Trotsky become the first commissar for home affairs, in a, sen in a sense to be in charge of security, internal security, for the new communist government. Trotsky turned him down. He felt that having a Jew in that position was too sensitive, that, that too many people in the country would not be able to accept a Jew in that role. And Sverdlov agreed with him, but Lenin couldn't understand why such a trivial matter should get in the way. And soon, of course, in 1918, Trotsky creates the Red Army. He does intervene against pogroms, and he intervenes against a pogrom being carried out by elements of the Red Army as well. So let me, but at the same time, the whites were focusing on Trotsky as a Jew. And this was very uh, disturbing to Trotsky, of course, because they kept saying, well, Trotsky's a Jew, and Trotsky represents the worst of the Bolsheviks. Let me just read you a bit about that. If I can find it. During the Civil War, Trotsky had to deal with anti-Semitic attitudes among the population. He voiced his concern over the high number of Jews in the Cheka, the secret police, knowing that their presence could only provoke hatred toward Jews as a group, this for the same reasons that he resisted becoming Commissar of Home Affairs. He successfully recruited Jews for the Red Army because they were eager to avenge pogrom attacks, but argued in vain in favor of forming Jewish units hoping that they would counteract anti-Semitic claims that Jews were avoiding military service. On at least one occasion in July 1920, he heard about a unit of Red Guards that was targeting Jews in Novorossiysk. His intervention brought an end to the pogrom. Now, one of the great ironies of history and of Trotsky's life is that both the whites and later the Nazis used Trotsky's Jewish background against him at the same time that Stalin used Trotsky's background against him. So for example, during the Civil War, newspapers circulating in white-held territory used the image of Trotsky to stir opposition against the Bolsheviks. Followers of Simon Petlur in Ukraine were known to scream, down with Trotsky, during their murderous attacks on Jewish towns. Black Hundred leaflets claimed that Trotsky was turning churches into movie theaters but leaving synagogues alone. Another leaflet claimed that Lenin and Trotsky wanted to convert all the peasants into Jews and then circumcise them, <laughs> while yet another described how the Jews were the carriers of Bolshevism, as if Bolshevism had infected their blood. In a country where Jews had been persecuted and marginalized for so long, it must have been unnerving for millions of people to see Jews among those in charge of the country. Now, soon after the Civil War, Stalin began to assert his predominance. Trotsky was increasingly marginalized. And he grew very upset that Stalin was using his, Trotsky's Jewish origins to marginalize him, to compromise him in the eyes of other party members. And even in the 1930s, when, when Trotsky's second son, Sergei, was arrested, and by this time, Trotsky is out of the country in exile in Europe, Newspapers would denounce Sergei as Bronstein. He had not taken his father's name, he had taken his mother's name, who was not Jewish, which was perfectly acceptable in Russian society. And Trotsky grew very upset at this anti-Semitic maneuver by Stalin. Also, in the 1930s, Trotsky, of course, denounced Stalin's policies toward Nazi Germany. Uh, he denounced the idea that uh, the communists should be uh, fighting against the Social Democrats rather than uniting with them. And it's very clear that Trotsky understood the vulnerability that Jews faced under Hitler. Um, let me just find that passage. So by the 1930s, Trotsky well understood that war was coming. And with the war likely, the fate of the Jews intruded on his consciousness. In February 1932, Trotsky wrote to an editor in New York 
that he was against Zionism and all other aspects of self-isolation on the part of the Jewish workers. So his Marxist ideology was trumping any particular concern for Jews. But in late 1933, Trotsky told, told the New York Times that he viewed Hitler's persecution of the Jews as a way to distract the population from the country's social problems. He knew that he had not studied the Jewish question adequately. He had been asked by many people in Palestine and Europe and America to comment on the vulnerability of the Jews. And I think it shows his distance from his origins that he admitted he had not studied the problem adequately enough. But five years later, in September 1938, with the situation in Germany even more acute, Trotsky urges followers in the Fourth International to confront anti-Semitism, quoting, before exhausting or drowning mankind in blood, capitalism befouls the world atmosphere with the poisonous vapors of national and race hatred. Anti-Semitism today is one of the more malignant convulsions of capitalism's death agony. Three months later, in the wake of Kristallnacht, Trotsky's fears grew more urgent. The number of countries able to accept Jews decreases, he wrote. It is possible to, and the number of countries able to accept them decreases. It is possible to imagine without difficulty what awaits the Jews at the mere outbreak of the future world war. But even without war, the next development of world reaction signifies almost with certainty the physical extermination of the Jews. He wrote that in 1938. He could not imagine an alternative. The idea of settling in Palestine was a tragic mirage. Biro Bajan, the Soviet Jewish autonomous district near the border with China, was a bureaucratic nightmare, he called it. He expressed both profound anxiety over the fate of the Jews and obtuse ideological prescriptions of what they should do. Now more than ever, the fate of the Jewish people, not only their political, but also their physical fate, is indissolubly linked with the emancipating struggle of the international proletariat. Trotsky was so fanatically connected to this Marxist ideology that he could never get past seeing the world through this kind of prism. But nonetheless, I'd like to end by quoting something he said on the eve of World War II. Trotsky wrote about the trial of Mendel Bayless in the fall of 1913 while he was living in Vienna. He was very upset about the trial. He understood it was an anti-Semitic maneuver on the part of the Tsarist government. And he wrote many, many articles in defense of Bayless and denouncing the Tsarist government. And he recalled that later in 1939 in the last year of his life. In the last year of his life, after Stalin had orchestrated the Great Terror, and as Hitler's bellicose intentions became increasingly clear, Trotsky invoked the image of Mendel Bayless. Retrospectively, he wrote, in the light of civilization's latest achievements, especially in Germany and the USSR, the Bayless trial today seems almost a humanitarian experiment. With Europe on the verge of a monstrous calamity, Trotsky could think of no better way to personify the continent's suffering than to invoke the image of a poor, lonely Jew falsely accused of killing a Christian child. I think in that way, Trotsky was more of a Jew in spite of himself. Thank you. It's a little daunting to go up after those two. I'll do my best. I, I think it's pretty well agreed that the 1917 revolution transformed Russia. I think it's a little less understood the extent to which it transformed those who participated in the revolution as well. As emperors became prisoners and prisoners became uh, jail keepers, those swept up in the revolution found themselves rebelling not only against a political or a socio-economical status quo, 
but often against the fiber of their very own beings. Faced with impossible but unavoidable questions on matters of war, um, nationality, revolution, those participating in the revolution found themselves shouldering new roles and discarding basic assumptions while fighting to keep abreast of Russia's breakneck run through 1917. At the onset of the revolution, Rafael Abramovich's status in the Bund seemed both clearly elucidated and unimpeachable. Having joined the Bund at the age of 21 um, in 1901, Abramovich had quickly established himself as both an intellectual and a diplomat. When the Bund exited the Russian Social Democratic Labor, Labor Party in 1903, it was Abramovich who had played the critical role of keeping the channels of communication open between the two parties. And again, it was Abramovich who had negotiated the Bund's return to the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in 1906. In the years since, um, he had impressed many throughout the revolutionary world through his persistent, although ultimately fruitless, efforts to heal the Menshevik-Bolshevik split as well. A gifted intellectual and a natural intellectual and a natural diplomat, he seemed more difficult, uh, more comfortable rather, having a spirited but civil conversation in a cafe in Paris or in Geneva than writing a manifesto or speaking to the masses. Popular, but not especially commanding, insightful, but not really charismatic, Abramovich was an unlikely leader of any sort, least of all a controversial one. And yet, as he recalled in his memoir, um, in a foreshadowing of what, would, what was yet to come, it became clear to him, quote, immediately from the first two words spoken to him by his old friend Henrik Ehrlich, who had come to greet him at the train station upon his return from exile in Switzerland, that many of his old friends and comrades in the Bund's leadership had not wanted him to return at all. The reason for the skepticism toward Abramovich had to do with the debate among Russian uh, Marxists over their stance toward World War I. At the outbreak of the war, most Russian Marxists had answered the internationalist call and refused to support their country's war effort. However, the abdication of the Tsar had changed things. No longer was Russia a bulwark of autocracy in Europe. It was now, by many metrics, the freest country in the world. Russian radicals found themselves confronted with an impossible choice. Between their commitment to defend and advance the cause of the revolution and their rejection of all imperialist wars. For most of the Bund's leadership, the first position won out terming themselves revolutionary defensists. They continued to advocate for a democratic peace, but not at the expense of neglecting Russia's war effort. They thought it was important to defend Russia, um, even while rejecting reparations and insisting on the right of all nations to self-determination as part of a final peace settlement. Abramovich, however, was among the minority who refused to make this leap. As he saw it, the February Revolution, while the greatest leap forward in Russia's history, remained an essentially bourgeois revolution. Ever the intellectual, Abramovich reasoned that it made little difference whether the German bourgeois or their Russian counterparts ruled in Russia, as either would continue oppressing the Russian working class uncompromising in his opposition to any radical support for the war effort, Abramovich quickly emerged as a leader in the internationalist movement in both the Bund and the Menshevik organizations, along with figures such as Yuli Martov and Nikolai Sukhanov, uh, 
even before he had returned to Russia, even while he was still in Switzerland, writing from afar. The result was a point of incredible tension hinging on Abramovich. He was deeply respected and admired by both the Bund and the Menshevik leaders. Again, his, his diplomacy and commitment to reconciliation and coalition had been absolutely key to the creation of a united Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in 1912. But even in the very early weeks of the revolution, in those first days after the Tsar's abdication, it was clear that there could be no compromise on the issue of the war. One either supported it or one opposed it. There could be no middle ground. As a party, the Bund placed an absolute premium on organizational loyalty, favoring it over ideological faithfulness and allowing for a great deal of theoretical diversity. It seemed as first, at first that this tradition won out and Abramovich was, in fact, appointed to the Bund's Central Committee in absentia, even before he had made it back to Russia. He was also appointed editor of the Bund's Petrograd-based newspaper, the Arbiter Stimme, the Worker's Voice, um, as well as to the organizing committee of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party um, after he returned to Russia. In June, he joined the Bund's delegation to the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, um, again, the diplomat, where he would successfully lead a campaign to recognize the rights of minority nations in what had been the Russian Empire to territorial and cultural autonomy. This campaign, it should be noted, um, was partially responsible for the formation of the current borders of the former Soviet Union. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or not, but there it is. Following the Congress, Abramovich would go on to serve as the, Bund's, um, leader, the leader of the Bund's delegation to the Executive Committee of the Soviets, the premier radical body in Russian politics. It seemed as though the Bund had overcome its disagreements and that things were proceeding smoothly. However, you may get used to that word in this presentation, when dealing with an issue as uncompromising as World War I, in which the Bund's decisions and the radical leadership's decisions would play a role in deciding the difference between life and death for millions of soldiers, civilians, and quite possibly the revolution itself, the Bund's ability to tolerate a diversity of opinion understandably deteriorated. Even as Abramovich was brought on to the Central Committee, other committee members, including Esther Frumkin and her brother-in-law Aaron Weinstein and their friend David Zaslavsky, were actively working to marginalize him and limit his influence, while they and the remainder of the Bund's leadership devoted the Bund to supporting Russia's now revolutionary war effort. Often, uh, Abramovich would write about years later, often the revolutionary defensist faction in the Petrograd Soviet, who were at the time dominant, would actually deny him the ability to speak as a way of preventing him from speaking out against the war. Abramovich refused to acquiesce. After returning to Russia in May, he immediately broke with party discipline and he used and began actively campaigning against the Bund's um, support of the war. Unable to speak out in the Soviet, he used his position as the editor of Arbiter Stimme to make his views known, constantly, incessantly demanding the immediate, quote, liquidation of the war on the principles of international revolution. This was unprecedented. The Bund had always tolerated heterodoxy. Even as late as 1917, many older members of the party maintained reservations regarding the Bund's embrace of nationalism. But for a party leader to actively campaign against the party's official view was inconceivable. This is not how the Bund worked. <laughs> 
it, it is extremely unlikely that even Abramovich w would have expected um, his actions just months earlier. The man was a diplomat, not a rabble rouser. But for Abramovich, who refused to accept that the February Revolution constituted an authentic proletarian rising, it was impossible to either compromise or relent in his opposition. Through most of the summer of 1917, it seemed as though the efforts to contain Abramovich were working. Although he did have a significant following from the Bund's rank and file members, the middle and upper level leadership remained staunchly committed to the party's official line to the defense of the revolution. That August, however, things changed. That August, the, Southern, the South Russian Regional Committee of the Bund held a conference in Kiev from August 18th to 21st, an event that was intended to serve as a much needed opportunity for the Bund to gather itself and reflect on what it had, what it had been through so far in the revolution. Instead, it, broke, it stretched the Bund to the breaking point. The conference included some 82 participants, both delegates from, the, from Ukraine and also members of the Central Committee. Um, it represented about 11,000 of the 16,000 Bundists in Ukraine. And although few records of the conference still exist today, um, what is clear is that by the end, Abramovich um, had won, that as a representative of the Central Committee, he had won over a plurality of the delegates, and under his leadership, they had passed a vote demanding an immediate end to the war by 34 in favor, 27 against, and 16 abstentions. While hardly overwhelming, this victory marked the first time that the southern region of the Bund, um, itself home to nearly half the Bund's total membership at the time, stood in opposition to the Bund's Central Committee on one of the most pressing issues at the time, and that they no longer felt bound by party discipline to accept the Central Committee's position if they disagreed with it. Today, we may not be so surprised by this development. Any reading of the documents available make it abundantly clear that support for the war had collapsed uh, following that summer's disastrous offensive and really revealing the success of the Bolshevik anti-war agitation. The Bund's leadership, however, did not have the benefit of hindsight. And while they were aware of popular sentiment, don't seem to have fully grasped the extent of the situation. And they were caught unprepared. The party leadership panicked. One Petrograd-based um, essayist from the Bund wrote that he feared, the, he feared that the war would be ended by the, quote, Philistine pacifism of the anarchists in the party. The rift in the Bund was now laid bare. The issue could not be dodged any longer. The following month in September, the Bund made an effort at reconciliation. September marked the 20th anniversary of the Bund's founding in Vilna, and it seemed an opportune moment to rally the party together. A jubilee was planned to take place in Minsk on September 27th, and at first, things went according to plan. Esther Frumkin established herself as a talented song leader, leading the Bund in a parody of the Passover song Echad Mi Odea, who knows one, only instead of God being one, they sang, one is the Bund, the Bund is one, and others are none. <laughs> it, it, the Jubilee seemed a pleasant respite. Um, even while the debates continued, they took on a more conciliatory tone. Abramovich recalled how in stark, stark contrast to their conversations just days earlier, it had become and I'm quoting his memoir here, very pleasant to sing Hasidic ditties with Esther Frumkin, 
or to engage in political discussions in the meetings of the Central Committee. Unfortunately for those present, the detente was fleeting. The longer the discussions proceeded, the more the tempers flared. It got so bad that um, Abramovich would describe how any dialogue became simply impossible. A special commission consisting of Weinstein, Frumkin, and Abramovich had to be formed to try to moderate the arguments in a controlled environment. This solution only exacerbated the situation, particularly between Frumkin and Abramovich, who proved both of them just completely intractable. Dejected, Abramovich returned to Petrograd. The Bund had entered its 20-year jubilee on such, such a high note and ended in greater chaos and bitterness than before. The timing of the breakdown could not have been worse for the Bund. The elections for Russia's Constituent Assembly and the All-Russian Jewish Congress were scheduled respectively for November and January. The Bund could not agree on how to define itself, much less how they sought to define their country or their nation. By the time the hammer blow fell on the Bund in the form of the October Revolution, the Bund, which had once been lauded for its discipline and its unity, had already been severely broken. Now, it, it is important to note, as I wind up, that even while splitting his party over the issue of the war, Abramovich remained absolutely committed to the politics of coalition throughout the fall of 1917, even after the Bolshevik seizure of power, the coup of October. Abramovich continued to advocate for the creation of a unified social democratic front, including one that would include both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. He even went so far as to suggest that the Bund leave its alliance with the Mensheviks in, so that they could be neutral arbiters in the conflict between the two. Abramovich was not a loose cannon. He was not trying to undermine his party or divide the left. He and his party were faced with a simply impossible choice between opposing the bloodiest war in human history or defending the revolution. In this, Abramovich came out against his party. Even as he fought to unify the left, his actions broke the Bund. The party, which again had been absolutely known, it had been a byword for discipline and unity, became a mess, a, a broken mess of a party. It limped into the crucial months of the revolution um, toward disastrous showings in the elections for the Constituent Assembly and the All-Russian Jewish Congress. Even before the Bolsheviks had seized power, the way was already paved for future splits, including the party's eventual schism into communist and anti-communist organizations and toward its eventual dissolution in Russia. Thank you. So I would, I would like to ask the uh, speakers to please come up. We have uh, actually about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Because we were disciplined. <laughs> Yes. The Trotsky family is a good example. Uh, revolution enabled the effeminate Russian Jew to man up. Leon Trotsky's brother was boiling pastrami in his restaurant on 34th Street here while Leon was creating and leading the Red Army. If that's not a, an example of what getting involved in the revolution can do to your cojones, I, I don't know what else. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Next question. <laughs> Uh, I've been listening to the last speaker, and I'm thinking of our current time, but I'm going back to a century ago. What was it about the boom a hundred years ago that made it fall apart? Was it the variety of members that really shouldn't have been in one organization but ended up in one organization, or part of its, of its structure, <coughs> Uh, which it could not foresee. Why did it fall apart? It's not just a history of a came in a, a good people. It looks to me like an organization that was not set up for such, uh, for such a time. There, I mean, there are organizational problems, to be sure, but I, I think that the real issue it has is not organizational or personal. It's historical. They're trying to keep it together at an, they're, they're faced with impossible choices. You have to defend the revolution. You cannot involve yourself in an imperial war, but you have to make a choice. What do you do? Y um, later on in the 1920s, again, you have to seize the opportunity. This is your chance to advance the revolution. It means joining the Bolsheviks, jo but you find the Bolsheviks to be Repulsive, but you have to make a choice. What do you do? I, I don't know if it's an organizational or a personal problem. I think it's just to reflect the impossible time that they were living in. Elisa? Um, I mean, I agree 100% with uh, what Josh said. I mean, it, w it was about uh, uh, making an impossible choice and, and, um, and you know, some people made that choice. Uh, now we, ex post facto, we can, you know, um, judge them, uh, or we can try to understand the, the position in which they, they found themselves. But I don't, I agree that it doesn't have to do necessarily with, um, with the Bund as a party. Uh, no. Yeah? I'm a cantor, so you should. <laughs> uh, and my question uh, to whomever wants to, or all of you, is that the Jew, the Russian Jews who came here to this country, at least the many that I knew, loved the Soviet Union, despite whatever the the uh, bu they they were Bundists, they talked about it, but they loved the Soviet Union, they loved Stalin, and uh, et cetera. Uh, do you have any idea of why? What, why? Gener what, what generation of, what wave of generation are you referring to? Well, I'm in my late 70s. Uh, I'm talking about my parents. They were, they, they came, and my father came from Tsarist Russia, my mother from Odessa before the war, before the revolution. But they, they were in the 1905 revolution, which the Bundes were involved in. Is that right? Am I right there? It is. Yeah, you are right. Is there, is there a right. question? Well, the question is, why did the people who came here, the Jews, after that experience being described? They were the misinformed. <laughs> and, okay, I'll, I'll accept that. I think, uh, I think what you, you might be trying to say, maybe, but it, it might apply to a few generations before, is uh, something that reflects the reality of the revolution. I mean, the revolution of 1917, in a way, killed socialism. Um, but the socialists who left, who fled, then looked at the revolution. I mean, at Russia, at the you know, at what happened in in, in Russia, as a kind of um, um, with with. Um, celebrating it in a way. I mean, they're far away, they're removed from it, but they're celebrating it because, you know, you have a, the first socialist country that actually exists. 
But, but Russia, we know, I mean, what happened in 1917 destroyed and killed socialism and the possibility Look, of socialism. It, I was I flipping when I said they were misinformed, but the fact is that there were Jews and non-Jews right. who were so taken with the allure of this revolution, even after Lenin's death and everything Stalin did. I mean, there were Jews, there were Israelis in Tel Aviv in January of 1953 who accepted the accusations of the doctor's plot and mourned Stalin's death in March of 1953. Well, I, I, if, if I could just interject one thing, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's uh, quite relevant in, in this discussion to, to remember that it was Stalin and the Red Army that liberated Auschwitz, that saved the remnant of uh, Soviet Jewry. And for that, many Jews were, in fact, uh, very grateful. And so there was always a highly conflicted attitude. Uh, as Stalin's crimes became more evident, uh, it became much more easy for people to realize the enormity of the mistake. I'm sorry, I think I have the mic here. Uh, I could also shout it. Well, look, the, the, it was about, there was a social innovation that Jew, the fact that there was a revolution, a social revolution among the Jewish masses, that the Pale of Settlement ended not by the Bolsheviks, but officially by the provisional government. So it wasn't Lenin who did it. It was the first decree by the provisional government. But the, in the first decade or more of, uh, of, the, of the Soviet experiment in the 1920s, Jews flocked to the cities, they were literate, there was a place for them in Soviet society. And because this was a successor to regime, to an outright anti-Semitic regime, many, not all, felt comfortable in it. But obviously there was the anti-religious attitudes, there was the pressure on any kind of a Jewish tradition, and this, after all, Jews still kept trying to leave in the 1920s. You had Habima was founded in Moscow, right? The Hebrew theater they relocated to Tel Aviv. So there are always Jews who understood the writing on the wall and wanted to get out. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, uh, my question was about Trotsky. Um, here. Yes, sorry. please. I was giving the mic. <laughs> um, so one of the uh, first things that really uh, split Trotsky and Stalin and the conflict was understood in terms of you know, Trotsky's internationalism and Stalin's, uh, you know, the theory of socialism in one country. Now, of course, part of the anti-Semitic slanders against Trotsky was that he was internationalist because he was a cosmopolitan, ruthless Jew, uh, as opposed to Stalin, who was reviving, really, the Russian tradition. Now, this slander was also repeated by, say, Winston Churchill when he wrote a famous article called, you know, basically, Good Jews versus Bad Jews, and good Jews were the national Zionists who wanted uh, to settle, and the bad Jews were sort of and the internationalists who went everywhere and brought revolution epitomized more than anything, Churchill said, by Leon Trotsky, who was you know, this internationalist face of the revolution. So my question is that, do you think uh, Trotsky's Jewish identity had any role in sort of a, a very serious internationalism that he had? He felt himself at home everywhere. He um, sort of commented on minute details of politics everywhere, and he had a passion for revolution everywhere in the world in sort of an internationalist tradition that, that is later found also in, in Trotskyism as such. Do you think his Jewish identity had any uh, role in this, basically? Actually, I don't. Um, Lenin more or less shared Trotsky's point of view from a pragmatic point of view. They understood that the revolution would have difficulty succeeding if it alone was the only socialist experiment on the continent. So they were counting on revolutions to break out to support them in Germany and elsewhere. And when that didn't happen, Stalin, whether you like it or not, took a more realistic point of view and understood there were not gonna be these companion revolutions to help the Soviets, that they were on their own. And Trotsky didn't accept that. But let me say that, you know, I you may know I wrote a biography of Ehrenberg, Ily Ehrenberg, and during World War I, where he saw Jews fighting on all the fronts from various sides. He has an article in the Russian press, the pre-revolutionary Russian press, pre-February revolution, where he says, in the eyes of cosmopolitans, 
Jews are nationalists. And this goes back to Ro the Roman era. In the eyes of cosmopolitans, Jews are nationalists. In the eyes of nationalists, Jews are cosmopolitans. My question is about the parallels between the left-wing Buddhism and the Zionist again. Specifically, you know, it's been well known that uh, Ben Gurion in Poland spent a lot of effort kind of fighting against the Buddhists for kind of the hearts and minds of the Jewish young people. And also, you know, Zerzy Batinsky and Leon Trotsky came from the same Odessa, did the same kind of self-defense work, then went completely opposite ways. Is it really true that there are kind of the good Jews and the bad Jews, and this is the, this is the line that separates them? Well, I, I mean, good Jews or bad Jews may be in the eye of the beholder. Um, I mean, the relationship between the left-wing Zionists and the Bund varied tremendously. Paul and the Bund in 1917 officially did not cooperate. Their leaderships did not look at each other particularly fondly, but at the local level were fully cooperating, um, often much to the disappointment of their leaders. Um, it's one of those complicated issues where it really depends on who you're looking at and where and when. Both the Bund and the left-wing Zionists were moving targets in terms of their attitudes toward each other, toward local work, you know, their interest in Palestine or disinterest in Palestine. So it's not something that can neatly be answered. I don't know if that helps. But... Well, it, it didn't go extinct. It, it was murdered. <laughs> I, I just want to add, you know, what comes to mind is that actually under the Soviets, Poilation and Bund collaborated quite well in the context of the Yevsektia. Although more Bundists joined the Yevsektia, we do have a number of uh, members of the Poilation, especially in Ukraine, but even in Belarus. And they, you know, so they both become bad Jews in a way. And a lot of SS show up in the Yevsektia too. So uh, we, we have time for two questions. I'd like them to be on this side, on the left side of, of the room. Okay, I'm not, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm on the left or, or right side. I don't want to be typecast. You're on the left, um, you're corner the, left. Uh, <laughs> Or, or uh, just, but I, I, I have two quick points, but consider it one question. Um, uh, the, um, I can't remember whether I read this in, in Svi Gittleman's superb account of Esther Frumkin or in uh, Dole Ravinov itself, which, which I seem to remember there's a lithograph edition earlier than 22, that a copy here at Evo that was distributed in 20, uh, but, but that, that's, that's just a small footnote point. But I, I remember um, a, a passage in it, and I was surprised Listen, we, we talked about the, the text being designed for uh, non-Jews rather than Jews. I remember the passage where she describes the um, Kol Nidre service. Um, it's an extraordinary prose. And she talks about the minor key and how arresting it is. And precisely because it's so arresting and attractive, it has to be beaten. <laughs> and it has to be, be, be stopped. It's, it's an ex extraordinary passage of, of polemics and the other point is um, a, a bit of advertisement for the rabbi, the, the, the Chazid in his late 70s. If you're here uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m., I'm going to try to address your question. And at the end of my talk, I'll turn to you if you're here and ask if, if it's been addressed adequately. Okay? okay. <laughs> Back there. Last question. Sorry. You, you spoke of uh, impossible choices. Was it, in fact, um, more the lack of coming up with alternative solution that was sustainable over time? 
I mean, for whom? For, for when? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that captures exactly, you know, there's so many variables. It depends on who and, and when, and it changed from month to month. choice is impossible, doesn't it suggest that there's an alternative that hasn't been suggested or galvanized amongst the masses that was really the possible sustaining solution if neither solution at the, at the moment, whatever it may be, was workable? Well, not to get too um, meta here, but if a choice hasn't been suggested, does it exist? You, you either you support a war or you don't. I, is there a way to thread that needle? You have to support the war, but you can't. You have to defend the re revolution, but you can't involve yourself in an imperialist war. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.